Welcome to Elevating La Cultura podcast, a space where I talk with Latinas who are passionate about what they do and are willing to share their passion with others to change the narrative, especially for the next generation. Each season is centered around different topics, but all with the Latina perspective. This is season five and is going to be a little different. It's going to be a mini season with only six episodes and they will all be solo cast where I dive a little deeper into sharing my own story. I'm so excited to share more about what has brought me to creating this space. So vámonos and let's get into it. Hola and welcome to another week of season five where I'm doing a deep dive into sharing my story. Last week, I shared about my life as an entrepreneur, and today I'm going to be going a little deeper into how my identity as a Mexican-American has shifted throughout my life. Both my entrepreneurship and Latinidad are the foundation to my identity, and will give you some insight into why I do this podcast in the first place and why I want to cultivate this community. I've mentioned that I am the oldest daughter And while my mother was born in the U.S., my father immigrated here to the U.S. in his teens. They met in Chicago, and when they got married, they moved to the suburbs. They finally purchased a home in a suburb that was very close to the Indiana-Illinois border. It was a newly developing subdivision. I remember when we first moved in, they were still finishing building out houses at the end of my block. My neighborhood was predominantly white when we first moved in there. So the schools that I went to were also predominantly white. During my elementary and middle school years, I was definitely the minority when it came to people of color. As I advanced in grades, by junior high, I had two friends who were Mexican American and knew of a few others. It was around fifth grade that I started to actually feel the otherness from my classmates when it came to my identity. Comments about how dark I was in the summer started. They would say, oh look, I'm almost as dark as you. I remember in gym class learning line dances. I don't know if anyone else remembers those types of classes, but one of the songs that we danced to was the Macarena. And of course, I heard comments like, oh, you must already know this song, or is this your favorite song, or what are they saying? Even during the holidays, kids would come up to me and say, Feliz Navidad, and sing the song. Perhaps it was a way to relate to me. Perhaps it was their curiosity when they asked what kind of food my family had during Thanksgiving or Christmas. But I saw it. It was a distinction being made that I was not, quote unquote, normal. They knew I spoke Spanish and would ask me to teach them how to say things. It got a little annoying and eventually I just stopped speaking Spanish to them and I would just say, I don't know, when I was asked how to say something. It was around this time that I really leaned into assimilating. Any little critique or negative comment about being Mexican, I would store it away and try to do the opposite. I wanted to fit in, to be just like everyone else. I've always been labeled as shy or quiet, and perhaps that's because I didn't want to be noticed. I just wanted to blend in and get my good grades. It was during those formative years when kids are going through puberty that are crucial in self-identity. The messages I was getting was that people knew that I didn't quote unquote fit. I didn't fit in with my white peers. And the moment I knew was when I was trying out for cheerleading. Now, I already mentioned that I started to feel the otherness, but this was the moment that I knew I didn't fit in. I did the tryouts for cheerleading on a whim. I wanted to be part of something. And so why not go for cheerleading? I tried so hard. I practiced, I made up a cheer, but I didn't get picked. I was one of the few that tried out and didn't make it. Someone who had broken her ankle a few days before tryout did make it, and I didn't, but she looked the part. So I tried out for basketball. 
Now, I had no business playing basketball. I had never played in my life, and I didn't even know how the game worked. I didn't make it, but I was able to participate as the assistant coach. So for all my office fans, I was the assistant to the regional manager. And you know what I did? I was the best assistant I could be. I poured my heart into it. And I was finally part of a community. This community was predominantly black. And I realized that many of my teammates lived in my subdivision a few streets away from me. I started hanging out with them outside of school and basketball. I really enjoyed my time that year. I felt like while I was still the only Latina in my friend group, I felt seen and not othered. I saw that I could find safety with other people of color. High school was a roller coaster of a ride as well, where I struggled with my identity. When I entered high school, I saw it as an opportunity to maybe start over, to decide how I wanted to be seen. I wanted to be part of the same community I had with my basketball team, but I knew I didn't have the skills to be in a sport. So again, I tried to find my people. The Latine population was still a small percentage and I continued to assimilate into my honors classes. I ended up choosing to be part of the drama team in high school. Not like the being on stage part, but the behind the scenes part. I was part of set design, lighting, production for shows. Can you see a pattern? Wanting to be part of something, by, but only in the sidelines or shadows as a support. I'm super comfortable being an encouragement for other people who are in the spotlight. I wanted to find a community, but I wanted to blend in. It's funny how I can clearly see what my patterns for safety were. The lies that my voice wasn't good enough or that I was only worthy as the help or support were already ingrained. This continued into college. As a first-gen daughter, getting into college was the goal, and I ended up choosing to attend not only a predominantly white university, but a predominantly white Christian liberal arts university. I mean, that is a combo. Now, this whole time, I thought that if I assimilated well, No one would know I was different. Even going to a Christian college, I didn't admit that I wasn't raised Christian, but I really was raised Catholic until I went to high school and my family started attending a white evangelical church, which then guided me into pursuing a career in ministry. This is something super complex, but it's part of my story. When I started attending a white evangelical church, my thoughts on going to get my MBA shifted into pursuing a career in ministry. I remember two conflicting thoughts. One was, okay, this is my out of having to get my MBA and possibly failing and disappointing my father if I don't get into top schools or get a good job after. The other thought was, Oh no, I don't know how I'm going to end up with a career in ministry. But I'll just continue this path that the people around me are encouraging me to pursue. I knew that I was going to focus on my studies and that was it. However, I wasn't prepared for all the direct racism that would be sprinkled sprinkled in to my education. More than I care to admit. During those years, I was in survival mode. I didn't realize it then, but I had heard so much racism being in a white Christian space since high school that that it didn't faze me anymore. I didn't even know that it was wrong. I just thought it was a normal part of life and would either ignore it or laugh it off. No one had even told me what a microaggression was or that people could be and were being racist towards me. Because I had always been in predominantly white spaces, no one told me or helped me name what was happening. 
So I thought it was normal or something that I was doing wrong or to draw attention to myself. So I kept my head down, worked hard to keep up my GPA to keep my scholarships, and just navigated the injustices I came across the best I could. I also really desired to find community and ended up seeking out fellow people of color and joining groups where I could feel a connection to culture, any culture, even if it wasn't the Latine culture. My specific degree is a bachelor's in worship arts with a leadership emphasis. What does that mean? It means I took music theory classes, I had private lessons for piano, guitar, drums, and was part of a choir. I also took graphic design, photography, video production, radio broadcasting, along with church history classes and worship arts classes. It was fun being able to learn all of the creative things. However, when I graduated, I had absolutely no interest in working in or for a church. At this point, however, I was already set to graduate, so I finished and got through my classes to earn a degree at the end. But having to tell my parents that I would not be using my degree in the way that we had planned was not the most pleasant conversation. Thankfully, though, I was able to take the creative skills I learned and I use them all, even in my work now. So not only did I not go to school for an MBA, I went for a creative field and in the end decided I didn't want to get a job in the field I was qualified for. It was confusing then which is why I ended up going to work for my father while I figured out exactly what I wanted to do. So let me get us back on track and recap. By middle school, I had started to be conditioned to see myself as other and different from most of my white peers. In junior high, in seventh and eighth grade, I took a chance and put myself out there as an assistant in a sport that had a majority of my peers of color which I really connected to. That was probably my most memorable and happiest times in school as a kid. In high school, I continued to thrive on the sidelines and where I was influenced by the white evangelical church in which my family attended, they made me feel accepted, but also was a place where I experienced the most awful racist comments, mostly by the people closest to me. I'll get into those comments more in the next episode. But that brings me to graduating with a degree that I didn't want to use and navigating the complexity of a perceived failed attempt at higher education. My parents were okay, although probably confused, but they were still supportive and obviously willing to let me work in my father's business. You can hear in last week's episode how this is around the time that my journey as an entrepreneur started. And it's actually when my identity as a Mexican American started to shift back. I mentioned how I struggled to build our business as fast as my peers in the wedding industry. I also mentioned that in 2016, it was a pivotal year for my business when I photographed a wedding with my husband where my culture was appropriated. Again, I was tricked into feeling like I had made it and actually fit into a community that may, that was the wedding industry. But after this wedding, it was clear that once again, I was othered. It was clear that the space wasn't for me. I had had enough, but this time, instead of backing down, I thought of how I can shift this frustration into something positive. And that is when I went to Mexico for the first time by myself. I had been to Mexico almost every year since I was a child, we would go during spring break. Uh, we would go during the summers to visit my family. But this was the first time that I went by myself. I was taking a workshop in San Miguel de Allende. I needed to get away. I needed to reconnect with who I was, to take a break, regroup, plan, all the things. I needed to figure out what my next steps were and how I was going to get out of the wedding industry. This workshop was a perfect opportunity and they had one more room left, so I took it. I paid in full about a month before the workshop and got ready to go. 
This workshop was led by two Canadians. I'll pause there to let that sink in. Two Canadians leading a workshop in Mexico. When I arrived, I learned that they didn't know how to speak very much Spanish. I mean, after 10 years of leading this experience, come on. Either way, I made the best of my time. I took pictures, I stretched my eye and tried new things. It was honestly an amazing time of rest. This, this is where my current business started. I started to offer frame prints of Mexico while I shared my story and taught about what I was learning on Instagram. It was on this trip that I first started dreaming of bringing people back with me for a similar but different experience. I thought to myself, if these guys can lead a workshop in Mexico, I, as a Mexican American, can too. I can connect with other people who desire to learn about their roots as much as I do. We are five years since that idea, but now it's finally happening where I lead people to Mexico to learn and connect with Mexican culture. After that triggering wedding and this workshop, I saw there was a disconnect with what people perceived about me as Mexican American and the harmful reality of perpetuating those ideas. This is when I desired to be more vocal about Mexico and my experiences in general. I think this is a perfect time to break for a quick commercial about my next trip to Mexico. Let's take a quick break because I'm so excited to announce my next guided trip to Mexico. Join me on a guided trip to Mexico City this October as we learn about Mexican history, traditional cooking, and immerse ourselves in experiences that will cultivate thoughtful conversation about ourselves and our ancestral legacies. This is the time to pour into yourself and enjoy a meaningful and curated trip where I take care of everything in Mexico and all you have to do is enjoy. To get all the details and apply, visit GarinaMora.com. Now back to the show. I've been on this journey for the last five years of undoing the harmful thoughts I had about myself that date back to middle school. It's taken therapy to help me navigate all of the emotions I had bottled up. Honestly, the thing that has been the most crucial is leaving a network and community that didn't help me and finding a community that I can feel safe around. It started with that one conversation with Jasmine for me to say, let me try to see if anyone else feels the same way I do. And when I started being more vocal about my thoughts and experiences, more people started talking about their story, especially in the wedding industry. And I've had those people on the podcast. Most of the people that had an impact in my career change are the first season's guests of the podcast. So if you haven't yet, go back and listen to season one. This is why it's important for me to share and have these kinds of conversations. I know now that I'm not alone, and it's important for me to also show others that they aren't alone. Perhaps you've been asking yourself how assimilation has become so ingrained in your life. Perhaps there are even areas that you might not even realize you've assimilated because it's become second nature, but it still makes you feel some type of way. This is why I've created a whole day's event called Cultura Presente, Celebra Tus Raices, where we are going to do a deep dive on the effects that assimilation may have on you and how we can put strategies in place to reverse that way of thinking. I'm so grateful for the community I have now I've truly been inspired by this whole brand I'm creating that is for us, where you can feel safe being yourself. Shout out to my partner Sandy from Beauty Queens and collaborators Izzy and Daisy from the Hablando Claro podcast and our host location, Neuro Yoga Institute. You can get all the info on the event at elevatinglacultura.com slash events. I'm always up for continuing the conversation, so subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode when it goes live. 
I also encourage you to share with others because the more people we have talking about our stories as Latinas living in the U.S., the easier it will be to make a collective change for a better future. There'll be a new episode every Tuesday, so after you listen, feel free to take a screenshot to post on Instagram and tag at Elevating La Cultura or send me a DM. You can also comment on our YouTube video if you're watching online. I always like to hear from people and how they resonate with the stories that I share. So leave a review on Apple Podcasts so we can get more ears listening to these stories and we can continue elevating La Cultura. The next episode, I'm going to be going a little deeper into my story as a wife. And this one is going to be a trip. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day, afternoon, evening, whenever you're listening. Y nos vemos next week. Bye.